which going and basically selling out and saying, go and affect my race so that, you know, we could get a position is, is, you know, typical, I guess, George, but, you know, in the end, they still got out of it and they both got points and, um, it was a good, uh, day for them and their organization, the most points they've had in years. So great momentum going into the summer break. Russell gets points while, you know, the guy that he theoretically is battling for a seat took out six, five cars. And so, I mean, that that's probably a good deal for him. And, but I, my thing with the whole entire race was, was how, you know, Mercedes basically did their usual thing and gave it away. Like, yeah, that that was interesting. That because at the time I thought, what what is going on? But then I remembered that if they spoke to Lewis on the on the uh, on the formation lap, you get a penalty like penalty like Magnussen did last year. So they couldn't risk it. And I guess I didn't actually properly see it because I was feeding Rex at the time, but. I guess the um, Ocon just went into the pits and everybody just thought, you know what, this is the right thing to do. It's dry enough. And they just went for it. I mean, that's fair, but I think everybody else was talking on the radio. They were asking him what the conditions were and he says he was telling him and you could tell in his post race that, you know, he's like, I don't know why we have to make this difficult all the time, but we learn from it all the, (laughs) but that's literally the truth. Like it's, Mm, yeah. It's part and parcel. It, you you say he's won 60, 70 races, whatever the hell he's won for for this team. But, you know, for just as many races as they've won, there's just as many examples of these kind of mind-numbing decisions that, you know, fine, he pits and everybody else stays out. They're all screwed and he comes back out in front. It, I'd rather you go and give yourself the best opportunity to win. And then if you're going to leave him out at that point, you have to go and do something. You bring him in right straight away. He's going to come in out right in the back of the pack. Like I know the, the intermediates weren't going to last, but like at that point you made your bed, go as far as you can on them, let them become slicks and then get the hell off of them. You know, like I don't get it. Mm, I don't know. It's, I mean, look, it's worked out well for him. He's made, what, 14 points up on Verstappen this weekend. I think Think, more than took that going into it. He'll be frustrated, of course, but I think with everything that happened, it's not a bad weekend for him. Very bad weekend for Bottas, though, of course. Oh, yeah, no. It's that, that, um, his terrible start, plus the, the whatever whatever the hell he wants to call what he did there in turn one, um, not only destroyed basically the third place battle in points, uh, it allowed Carlos Sainz to get a tied with Charles Leclerc too, which is interesting. Um, yeah. Daniel, Daniel Ricardo, mediocre day. And now he's only two points ahead of Vettel and Gasly. And now actually Ocon is in that fight for, after winning the race. So now all of a sudden it's 11 points between those guys. And it's actually 14 points between Ricardo and Alonso. So now there's actually a good fight for the top 10 positions in the back end of the top 10. Um, Ferrari's um, world championship situation or drive constructors championship situation is much better. Now they're only three points back. So, and then Mercedes is 10 up. Um, they've the two points last two races because of Sergio Perez and Pierre Gasly taking those fastest laps, but it is what it is on that. Alpine takes a nine point lead on Aston Martin and Alpha Tori. They have 11 point lead. I thought it would be a little different than that. So that's actually, I'm intriguing, but Williams, that's the big one. Um, jumping Alfa Romeo, um, that's massive, that's massive for them. The eighth place finish by. Latifi for however useless he may be <laughs> is is gonna probably get the Mathe in the constructors championship uh, with and and that's a big deal for them as they move towards next year. Um I mean I think there are a couple of Grand Prix, I think depending on how the wind is at uh at uh whatchamacall, at the Dutch Grand Prix and 
couple other That's circuits, big, yeah. Singapore, the uh, Singapore. Uh, there might be a couple other circuits. I thought they would do a lot nah, better. Sing- Singapore's canceled this year. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. sorry. It's all right. Yeah. Japan could be windy, but there's a lot of. I don't. About I don't that. think Japan's gonna go ahead. That's why Bobby Epstein was sitting there because all of a sudden he's like, I haven't had an F1 race in a while. I haven't had a big open wheel race, <laughs> and all of a sudden he brings him and his wife sitting there and hungry randomly. Next thing you know, we're gonna have a U.S. Grand Prix and we're gonna have an Austin Grand Prix. It sounds like they're already hedging bets on that. Yeah, yeah. we for a while. Yeah. Should we um? Should we get going? I just need to get the race results up because Wikipedia doesn't have them yet. This is that's all correct though. Yeah. The F one, right. I I have F one up, so that's I, I got BBC Sport up. I have got Google up. I think it's got it all right. It doesn't have the gaps, but it doesn't really matter. I can kind of remember them. I mean, yeah, Ocon thing. won by one point eight seconds over Vettel and two point seven seconds over Hamilton. I'll use that actually. Thanks, Tom. So, and then that's yeah, that's got the um, that's got the split times in it for everything. Oh, there you Fantastic. go. Fantastic. Oh, right. Let's put that there. Sorry, I speak out loud when I'm doing things. It's like it's our work. Like, I have to do this at work a lot. Just like loads of tabs, loads of windows. Uh, I do the same thing. It's what I do on the show, uh, my show, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah, we can get going, lads, if you're up for it. Yes, sir. Let's do it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Esteban Ocon has won a Formula One race, and George Russell has scored points in the Williams. No, this isn't April Fool's Day. This isn't a joke. I'm being deadly serious. We've just witnessed one of the most surprising Grand Prix I can remember in a very long time. It's an unbelievable race we've experienced here. Um, yes, welcome back to the Grid Talk podcast, everybody. This is episode number 125, where we'll be reviewing the 2021 Hungarian Grand Prix. Hungaro Ring has delivered yet again. An unbelievable race. First time winner. And we're going to dissect it all here for you guys. I am your host, George Housen. And today I'm joined by Phil Matthew of the Grip Strip podcast. Hello. And Tom Downey of the EF1 podcast. Hello. Right, lads. Thank you for joining us. So for a change, we're actually not going to go to the winner. We're going to start with the start line crash. Now we had intermediate conditions the start it was drying rapidly but the, all the time ty- all the drivers started on intermediate tires and it was just a chain reaction really from Valtteri Bottas outbreaking himself Tom and I think in the end six drivers ended up retiring because of that well no sorry five drivers ended up retiring because of that a quarter of the field yeah um I mean Bottas has played just my wingman here isn't he you know he took up both the Red Bulls <laughs> Um, to give Hamilton the best chance. No, I'm not being serious by saying that. But yes, um, Bottas, oh God, ready to begin. Um, you know, it's a typical Bottas weekend, really. Solid, sort of free practice, top in the time seats on the Friday. Quality on the Saturday, just a bit out of reach, and on Sunday, just, well, implodes, really. He had not a very good launch, well, he had a terrible launch off the line. Understandably so, as obviously we had rain coming in when we least expected it, or you know, without much prior warning. Um, but he just couldn't get off the line. His second phase of the launch just didn't just didn't happen. Um, I noticed on his onboard when he launched, he was steering quite hard to the right. Um, so I don't know if the back was stepping out on him already at that point, um, even though he'd launched in seconds. And then, yeah, um, the McLaren goes past him, Norris goes past him, he's got... The Red Bulls alongside him, who both moved past him, or well, Verstappen was ahead of him because Verstappen was closing in on Lewis. And then he just gets his breaking point completely wrong. If you look at the onboard of Bottas, as he goes past the 150 meter board, you can see the gap between him and Lando closing quite rapidly because Lando has braked, his body in front has braked. But it's only by the time he gets about the 100 meter mark of board that Bottas has actually gone, oh heck, I better slow down. But by that point, Cold tyres, slippery conditions, it's far too late, couldn't do anything. 
And as we saw, he smashed into the back of that, that McLaren, which then wiped out. I think that incident took out four cars on its own, three or four cars on its own. Yeah, a lot of drivers involved in that. I mean, the, you can really launch into turn one of the Hungara ring, but Bottas was taking that way too far. There wasn't a lot of grip around. There was a lot of rain. Those who watched the Formula 3 earlier in the day will have noticed that there was a torrential downpour of rain. The, all the grip would have just gone. That track would have been very, very slippery indeed with the rain around as well. But yeah, Valtteri Bottas getting his drive his breaking point completely wrong, taking out Lando Norris, which is very sad for him. He started in sixth place. His streak of being the only guy to score points in every race is now over, sadly. Um, and also caught up in that incident, Sergio Perez, Charles Leclerc and Lance Stroll, and as well, Max Verstappen got some damage. He continued, but he had massive damage to the side of his car. The red flags came out and he had to wait about half an hour to get the action going again with just 15 cars. Um but me, me and Tom were mentioning uh, before you joined the session, I think, Phil, that Lance Stroll as well hasn't covered himself in much glory from this one. Yeah, I mean, it's it's Lance Stroll. Uh, you kind of figure that. Uh, the When we get into the actual main part of this race and what his, um, of course, much more heralded and well-renowned teammate did today and could have possibly done today, uh, you know, Lance Stroll, that's the same thing that happened at Baku and a similar result happened for the Aston Martin team on the other side of the garage. Uh, you know, it's it's not that it's unex, uh, unexpected. You know, you kind of, for me, I, I have, I hold him at a very, I don't hold him at a very high level anyway, but, you know, right now you look at where he is in the driver standings. He's only two points ahead of Yuki Sonoda, and he's and Yuki Sonoda has had a night a mare of a year, and until you know last this race here and maybe a couple others. But you consider where he is; he's thirty points behind his teammate right now, and that's of course two second place finishes. Um, when you look at the whole entire third place battle in the drivers' championship, was taken out in that wreck. It's, I mean, it's a sad deal how it happened and what happened. It's a part of racing. Um, Tom, you know, tongue in cheek going and saying the wingman role and basically doing a bowling ball, a level, uh, a finish right through and leaving a nice split and taking out Red Bull. So in making all the orange idiots um, lose their minds and then all the people who love Sergio Perez freak out to all 12 of them. Uh, you know, like it, it was a bad day for them to, in general. I mean, for Lance Stroll, it's whatever. Uh, I, it's a good thing they have a good driver in the other car, or else they'd have a real problem in regards to scoring points. But for Red Bull, I think we'll get into it in more detail. For McLaren, it was a brutal day too. Um, you know, Charles Leclerc has no luck either. I mean, it's scary how he gets involved in things or things happen to him, uh, you know, and then Lando losing that point streak, as you said, only point scorer all year, 15 race point scoring streak. Um, best ever for a McLaren driver to lose that um, was a bummer. Cause I think that was definitely, they had a car. If he had made it through that wreck, he could have possibly won that Grand Prix and he definitely could have gotten a podium. Um and so it's unfortunate for them and Leclerc and, you know, for Verstappen uh, being collateral damage there. Um, it took until basically the end of the race. And we'll get into that more. But, I mean, it's slant stroll. What are you going to say? <laughs> yeah, no, I know what you mean about uh, about Leclerc. Yeah, he seems to have no luck when it comes to accidents. He, I, mean, I still remember that. I was at that race in 2018 in Belgium when he... You know, the halo, frankly, it saved his life. You know, if that wasn't there, it could have been a very, very scary accident. Um, but yeah, I mean, that oh, the crash really opened because it was at the front of the grid. It really opened up the guys behind. I mean, Norris, Bottas, Perez, Leclerc, you expect them all to be up there. They were all up there on the grid and it opened it up no end. Uh, Verstappen survived, but he had his damage. And Lewis Hamilton at the restart was the only guy to start on the grid. You'd think it was fake, that it, it wasn't a real image, that it was Photoshopped, but no, Hamilton was the one guy to actually start on the grid from the start. Everybody else, because the track was drying, everybody else on the grid, they all went in for dry tyres into the pits. They all started from the pit lane. 
And that opened up things up no end for Esteban Ocon, our race winner, Tom. And, you know, we've been criticising him since he signed his contract extension with Alpine. I think Phil said that he's been in hibernation because he was, quite frankly, he had a better weekend in Britain. But nobody ever would have predicted this. And it wasn't easy for him. Sebastian Vettel was on his tail for the whole race and he didn't put a wheel wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I've been fairly critical of Ocon ever since he signed his contract um, because it was Todd's Lord. It was a, I think I said at the time, he was a French driver for a French team at the, at the French race when he'd had his contract signed and he seemed to be downhill from there. But what a performance. I mean... You could argue that perhaps he lurked into that position because he started eight, and obviously there was a lot of carnage ahead of him. But you take the hand that you were dealt in life, um, and he was he was dealt a first position. And to hold off um, Vettel behind him for the entire race. Let's not forget Vettel is a four-time world champion, who you know who when he was in his prime, you know, granted ten years ago was the best driver on the grid. You know, he, you know, he was putting in performance after performance. He had, Vettel had been in many positions like this before where he's been chasing a lead, but anytime it looked like Vettel was going to get past him with DRS, with fresh tires, with a different line, Ocon was just able to just move his car into a position, keep enough of a gap, just hold him back and just, and just effectively force Vettel to burn up his tires. And it was just, it was just a perfect drive from, from, from Ocon in this position. I mean, if if you'd have told him going into this weekend that that he was going to win this race, you know, you know, most people would have probably laughed. But yeah, really, really well done to Ocon. Fantastic race. Yeah, unbelievable. And it's fully deserved. And if you'd have told me that Fernando Alonso was in that car, the number 31, I believe you. Because I think it, I think Alonso's probably taught Ocon a few things and That's he's funny. probably picked him up. And I mean, Alonso himself had an amazing race today. We'll get into him. But yeah, Ocon just, it's just, it, I just can't believe it. It just doesn't seem right. No. A, he had a second place last year, but again, you could say he looked into but this. He really, really had to work for. for. And just, just one other thing to add to what I was saying as well is Ocon is, I believe he's a year younger than me and I'm 26. The drive that he put in today was not the kind of drive you'd expect from a relatively young driver. Let's not forget he had a year out the year before last as well. Mm. And then last year he was very much sort of getting re readapted, if you like, with with Formula One. So he, he put in a drive today very much past his years. And, and like you just said, George, if, if you'd have told us that was Alonso in that car, we, we would have believed it. We wouldn't have known any different. Yeah. Absolutely. it's. I believe it's the first time a French driver has won a Formula One race in a French car powered by a French engine since Alain Prost nearly 40 years ago in 1983, that would have been. Um, yeah, I just can't wax the record off about Ocon. I mean, Phil, I mean, I'll let you have a word about Ocon as well. It's Hungary's a track that allows first time winners. We've seen it before. It's not nothing new, but we all thought it could have been maybe Norris or Sainz. We never ever would have predicted Ocon. Yeah, it's it's something that, based on what we've seen for a while this year, didn't seem possible. Uh, just like Tom, I've been very critical of Ocon, um, especially after the the signing, um, because Pierre Gasly's out there, and I figured if you're going to sign somebody who's proven they can win a Grand Prix and do all the well, now he's won a Grand Prix. And he held off a four-time world champion with 53 Grand Prix wins and all the other accolades that Sebastian Vettel has. Uh, it was a and his first win in a single seater um, in six years, more than six years. So I mean, it's been a long time for him. A lot of pain driving in back marker cars. Then he drove for the team that he beat today. Um, you know, like there, there's it's been hard work. Mercedes Junior, uh, he's a good dri He's been a good driver, and he's had the talent and skill. And to go and come through in this spot is a big deal for him. It's a big deal for the Enstone team as well uh, to to get this win at Hungary. I mean, of course, Fernando Alonso got his first Grand Prix win there in the same team. You know, like there's there's other people, other things over the years how this team has done well at. And he mentioned that in his radio post-race radio um, 
conversation there after winning driver of the day. I mean, it's a huge deal. It's uh, generally unexpected, but credit to him doing what he had to do. Unlike Stroll, unlike some of these other guys, he avoided that incident. He made the right moves. He also made the right, him and his team made the right decision on tires and basically dictated the race from there for the rest of the day. And it was literally from that point, a battle between him and Sebastian Vettel for what amounted for 65 laps. Um, and Esteban Ocon stood tall and uh, came through with a massive victory, not only for himself, but for Alpine, for the Enstone team, for France, all these different things, and sends himself into the summer break with uh, the amount of momentum and just the sheer jolt of energy that, I mean, it doesn't really matter what he does um, the rest of the year. I mean, you're not going to top that really. Um, but credit to him, credit to that team, Alan Permain, who's been there forever. I remember Alan Permain from when I first started watching Formula One, and that was 20 something years ago, and he's still there. Um, so credit to him, credit to that organization, um, Brivio coming from Yamaha, MotoGP, getting his first Grand Prix win as a team principal um, in Formula One. Uh, big deal for them in general. And credit to Ocon for a great performance. Yeah, it's huge. It's it's a real day of first. I mean, it's Alpine's first Formula One win. It's their first podium, I think, as well. Um, it's Renault's first win since coming back. It's the first one for... Um, for the Enstone team since Kimi Raikkonen in 2013, Australia, I think it was. Um, and yeah, like like both of you said, you know, we we all thought, and I thought that Gasly was a shoe in to replace Ocon. I thought, right, they've got Alonso, they're going to bring, you know, Gasly in. That's a really good solid partnership. Ocon, he's all right. He's nothing that he's not. He's not that special, but he's proved a lot of people, including a lot of our panelists, wrong. A lot of the critics have been wrong. It, it's just. And it is, you know, in a way, it's just come out of nowhere and it's fully deserved. It, it was not lucky. He kept his nose clean at the start, like a lot of people didn't. He made the right call to go. He was the first guy to go in the pits. He was second in the restart. He was the first guy to go in the pits. He took that deep dive and it paid off. So my hat's off to him. Superb. <laughs> Absolutely superb. Um, and, let, and let's not belittle what Sebastian Vettel has done either today, Tom. He's, he's matched his best result this season. He's matched Aston Martin's best result in Formula One. He's got a second place. He hounded Ocon for the win. He couldn't quite get past him, but, you know, it's still a very good day for Aston Martin. It's a very good day for the one side of the Aston Martin garage. Very bad day for the other one. It's, yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a very much a day of contrasting emotions, perhaps, for Aston. But for, for Vettel, certainly, yeah, brilliant day at the office. Again, took the hand that, that he was dealt, kept his nose clean when he needed to, and did his best to try and get past Ocon. Um, ultimately, couldn't quite make it stick. Dare I say, if we'd have been at a different track, say, for example, if this would have been perhaps Austria, we'd have probably seen a different result if you think about the circuit there with you know with all those DRS zones and everything. But um but yeah but Vettel great to great to hold up second place. Um and he can probably thank Alonso a bit as well for keeping Hamilton back as long as he did because otherwise I strongly suspect Hamilton would have been practically able to taste Vettel's gearbox a few a few laps earlier. But um but 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 yeah Again, Vettel, you know, almost a sort of, uh, what's the best way to describe it? I would say a, a sort of like vintage Vettel performance, if you'd like. You know, he's, um, he's just pulled it out of the bag when it's needed doing, when he's been a bit further down the grid. And a good result in a car that was not looking that strong this weekend. Yeah, I mean, Aston Martin, they, they, they looked about where they normally should be in qualifying. It was nothing too special, but yeah. Great day, great, great day for Vettel. His second podium for Aston Martin, um, and all that, all of that. This has really shook up the constructors' championship. It shook up the drivers' championship too. But because of all that, Alpine have actually gone into fifth. They're ahead of Alpha Tauri and they're ahead of Aston Martin. Aston Martin stays sixth. They leapfrog Alpha Tauri, and Alpha Tauri are going to be massively disappointed. I mean, yeah, they did get a. Res this would normally be a great result for them. But a team that we thought maybe could have been challenging for fourth this year, they're down in seventh again. 
But it is tight in that belt. It's just 12 points between them and Alpine in, in, in fifth. So anything can change. Anything can change there. Um, and completing the podium, a guy who was no stranger to podiums at all, a pole sitter for Lewis Hamilton. Now, he was down at the back after his pit stop. And he recovered very well, I feel. He drove the wheels off of that Mercedes at time and only finished less than three seconds off the lead. So I think in the circumstances with everything that happened, I think he more than, you know, he'll more than take that. Yeah, in the grand scheme, we talked about it offline uh, before the show started, uh, Jordan. It's for where they were and what where they started this weekend to go and get, you know, poll 101 for Lewis to get the start that he did um, while his teammate had his kind of start, um, hold the lead and be in a position to possibly dictate the race from whatever um, that decision was and to go and come from tailback to third. Uh, we'll get into, Tom, we'll get to talk about the guy that probably dictated the final result more than anybody else other than Ocon, really. Um Lewis had pace, but it took a long time to get said pace once he was behind the Alpine, struggled behind the Alpine of Gasly. Um, then he, the undercut allowed him to get past uh, Max Verstappen and Daniel Ricciardo, which basically set his race off. And he was able to kind of make, make hay from there. Uh, Alonso, that battle... Um, was everything uh, because after he passed Alonso, he was able to catch up to signs in very quick order. And then I think also Kimi Raikkonen um, being in the way because he's Kimi Raikkonen also may have played a role in that too. Um, and that those things probably um, affected what could have been win number 100 for Lewis. But in turn, I think Mercedes themselves did their usual, you know, junk step and put themselves in a position that they didn't need to. Um, but in, but to be bringing on a positive side, they have a driver's championship lead that two races ago, there were 32 points behind Max for stopping whatever you want to think about the incident at, at Silverstone, you can think, and it's whatever to me at this point, because Karen Horner and all of them have been still whining about it. Um, Max Verstappen, whatever, all his stupid idiot fans, just like Kyle Busch fans, um, their LCD. Um, so the fact of the matter is they go from 32 points back to 10 points up in the driver's championship or, eight or six points up in the drivers. They were 40, nearly 50 points out in the dri constructors, and now they're 10 points up going to the summer break. Uh, so in that sense, for as bad as Mercedes has managed recent races and the car has been at times they have found pace they've put themselves in a position to where they have an opportunity to get an eighth world driver's championship for lewis hamilton to get another consecutive constructors championship against a red bull team that's kind of in um in uh, a bit of bother right now not only because of power unit situation um a lot of damage recently um Sergio Perez kind of uh basically struggling uh, but yeah uh will the positive is Lewis Hamilton got third after being tailback gets a points drivers championship points lead um constructors lead back for Mercedes but I'm sure they wanted more out of this deal um after starting on pole yeah, and it was 1-2 as well, because Bottas was uh, alongside Hamilton at the start on the front row. Um, I'm sure they would have wanted more, but I think, again, in the circumstances, you know, they've got Hamilton instantly the Drivers' Championship for the first time since, well, I don't even know, probably Monaco or something like that. It's been a long time. Um, and again, they're leading the constructors as well. After Austria, it was looking like, right, Red Bull are going to walk away with this. They've got the fastest car. Nothing can stop Max Verstappen, but two crashes, one at Silverstone and and the incident here as well, we've got the damage, it really dented him. Uh, we'll get into Verstappen as well. He did finish the race, but nowhere near as highly as what he normally would have done. And it's six points still. It's 
in the Drivers' Championship. It's not a massive lead, but the fact that Hamilton has it now is really a statement of how things have changed. Um, but yeah, we'll get back into the order now. So, like Phil mentioned, fourth place today was Carlos Sainz, Tom, and it was a fantastic drive by him and his Ferrari. He was he was going against Ferrari's famous bad strategy. You know, he was saying, no, we need to stay out. We've got pace. We can do this. And he did it. He did a fantastic job and he held off his his idol at the end for fourth place. Yeah, it was it, it was a good race from, from times. You know, again, perhaps like some of the drivers ahead of him, he got a little bit lucky with, you know, obviously people retiring and accidents and people falling down the pecking order and what have you. But let's not forget, he was running third for a decent chunk of this race in a Ferrari, which is still inherently not a brilliant car because obviously there's still a lot of sort of tail or sort of like leftovers from the infamously bad car of last year and and they spent a, I think they ble- I think they spent all their tokens on the rear of the, of the car sort of getting that getting that sorted um but yeah signs signs did really well um I believe he was on one stop fewer. Yes. Yeah, he was on one stop fewer than Hamilton. So he was never really going to hold up Hamilton too much at the end because Sainz was on very, very old hard tyres and Hamilton was on relatively fresh medium tyres. Um, but I, I, I think fourth, good result for Sainz, really, really good result for Sainz, good recovery, good points for Ferrari, especially with Leclerc obviously getting punted by Stroll at the start. Um if I just look at it, yeah, fourth. Yeah, he was um yeah, he finished in the end six tenths ahead of, of Alonso. Um, yeah, it was it was, it was a good solid performance by Science. You could hear how disappointed he was as well on team radio to not finish on the podium, which I really get, and that shows the racer in him. But he should not be too disheartened by that. He should be really pleased with the performance he's put in today. Absolutely, yeah. He did a fantastic job, you know. We spoke about how drivers that have moved teams struggled at the start of the season. Carlos Sainz was the one guy who was slotted into that Ferrari like he'd, you know, he'd been there for years, you know, and now he's level on points for Charles Leclerc. I mean, thanks to Charles Leclerc's retirement, of course. But more importantly for, for Ferrari, they're only three points behind McLaren because McLaren had an awful weekend, a non-score for McLaren this weekend. First time this season, first time that Lando Norris has not scored either this season, of course, too. So... Yeah, incredible start as well. I think Phil said it about Norris being the longest point streak for any McLaren driver ever. And you think about some of the, the champions, some of the greatest drivers ever that they've had. And Norris has blown them. Yes, because of because of the uh, the points. Uh, sorry, because of the reliability now that you get with these um, uh, get these modern cars. But still, it's, it's an incredible feat by him. Um, incredible too, as well today, Phil, was Fernando Alonso, fifth place. Uh, he's not, he's, you know, people say that Kimi Raikkonen's too old, he can't compete, he's in his 40s. Well, Alonso's proved that you can compete in your 40s in modern Formula 1. And the defensive display that he put up against Lewis Hamilton was just mesmeric, just using every bit of experience that he that had. It was brilliant to watch. Yeah, it's the, there. there's a reason why he is well-renowned um, all over the world uh, in whatever he has driven. It's something that would you have thought years ago when he was whining Fernando Alonso, crying about the team and crying about this and calling Honda's engine a GP2 engine and all that stuff, you'd have never thought that we'd be back to seeing, you know, Fernando Alonso doing Fernando Alonso kind of things and running top five and being a consistent top five. It, It's last few races here have been, it took him about a couple months really to get resettled in into formula one but once i think it was really monaco or i think it was after spain so it was monaco and since then he's kind of gotten back into the groove and looked like fernando alonso again and this performance his defense uh was was outstanding i mean there was it kind of got edgy a couple of times but the fact of the matter is fernando alonso didn't do anything that could be construed as like super dangerous. Um, he didn't do anything that was, you know, really out of order. He was, yes, he was moving around a little bit. I mean, sure. Um, I think fundamentally, we I mentioned it before with Lewis, 
he had a move on him and because of Raikkonen coming out of the pits, um, that was the move. If he makes that move there, we're having a totally different conversation about this race. But that one instance right there allowed Alonso to again dictate um, pacing because literally after you get out of turn, once you get past turn four, you can't pass for the rest of the lap. And he, he just stelled off Lewis Hamilton. And that fundamentally was the race. And it shows that he's engaged. It's been a question about, you know, Fernando Alonso for many years. Oh, is he really invested? Does he care? No, he does care. And he does enjoy being with this team. He does like his teammate. There's a lot of positive energy. And I think he's looking forward to uh, whatever's going to come the rest of this season, but more forward to 2022. Because I think he's looking – the it's a different Fernando Alonso, more humble, more mellow Fernando Alonso. And now that he knows that he's at the twilight of his Formula One career – He's enjoying things a lot more. And I think they're going to be a sneaky uh, team next year with the new regulations, because now you have a young gun who's finally won a, who's won his first Grand Prix. You have a motivated veteran, legendary driver who wants to go back and win a race again, um, a team that's motivated. So it all comes from a great day. One of the best days that this team has had in a very long time. And Fernando Alonso did his job today um, in defense, really, but also gave himself a chance at a possible um, podium for a while there, too, um, racing uh, his young his young uh, protege of sorts and Carlos Sainz there late. But credit to Fernando Alonso. He, had, he played as much of a role in his 40th birthday weekend as anybody in regards to the final result of uh, this Grand Prix. Yeah, some people might say his defense was over the line, but I didn't see that. I thought it was, it was just absolutely perfect. He was absolutely real perfect, and much much of Hamilton's uh, annoyance, you know, he just he was always going to Alonso was always going to put up a really big defense against him, and he did. And it was again, it was great to see. And he could have got signs at the end for fourth as well, but not quite in the end. He just couldn't quite pass him. But there we go. Very good weekend for Alonso. Then, uh, you know, solid points as always. I think that's about six or seven point uh, races in a row he scored. Uh, I went for Alonso for my bold prediction for top five. I was half right. I went, also went for him for fastest lap, but that went to Pierre Gasly, Tom, who finished in sixth place. And I think all things considered, it was a very good weekend for him. He qualified in fifth. He had to battle through, really, to get up to sixth in the end. Yes, his teammate let him go, but he was much faster. So I think another good weekend for Gasly. Yeah, um, you know, Gasly, aside, aside from the top two and Norris, has been my driver of the season, much like he was last year. He's he's been uber consistent in that Alpha Tower. You know, he's constantly putting in good results, and this weekend, just another example of just how good a result he can put in, especially when the odds are stacked against him. Because mm. let's not forget that after the restart, he was, I believe, he was out of the points. Because he was, because he was battling with Verstappen. I know Verstappen was thirteenth at the restart. Yeah, he um, was. So, so for um, for, for Dazzy to work his way up through the field, yes, Yuki did let him pass, but it. But they are both racing for the same team, so you know, so so team orders do come into play somewhat there. And it was it was a, it was the right thing to do, even if Sunoda. Um, you know, perhaps got perhaps got got a little chopsy, as we say in Wales on the on the radio afterwards. Um, but um, but yeah, again, Dazzy top six. It's it's almost funny because he's been putting in these top six performances when we've had two Mercs and a Red Bull and a McLaren ahead of him, and and, and the one time that we don't that we've lost, effectively lost both the Red Bulls and one of the Mercs. He's still P6, and then he's got you know he's got an Aston and Alpine and stuff ahead of him, but yeah, Dazzy, fantastic result. You know, just keeps keeps adding to that CV of his, um, and it makes you wonder how much longer he'll be there before he has a before he has an offer or at least some serious conversations with a team higher up the grid about a potential seat. Yeah, it's only a matter of time, really, isn't it? Someone's got to take a punt on him eventually. Um, yeah, great result for Gasly again. And, and like the ultimate professional that I am, I missed fifth place for our five-star review. So I'll say it now. So if you leave us a five-star review, 
on iTunes, you get to have a shout out at the start of the show. I will shout out your name or Ruby will shout out your name. Um, depending on who the next host is. So yeah, we're getting a lot of good reviews on there, of course. And it's been wonderful to see really, you know, us climbing the charts. It's fantastic. So, um, and yeah, we'll get on to seventh place. Yuki Sonoda, uh, again, a solid day for him. You know, he, he, not many people saw it coming. I think he started down in 16th as well. So it's a hell of a drive really for, for him to get him there. And I can't remember if it was, uh, whether it was Steve or Tom on the on the qualifying show that said, oh yeah, maybe he needs another, you know, it would have been better for another year in F2. But he does have pace. He just needs to do this more consistently. Or he needs to have a quarter of the field get wrecked out on the first lap. And that always helps, and yeah. That, that, that also can play a role in that. Um, he kind of was in a no man's land. Uh, the Williams cars being up there kind of affected his race. He wasn't really able to do anything initially once the restart happened and then in turn had to go and um, give way to Gasly, which was the right decision. Um, getting a seventh place finish, uh, good points for him, getting a lot of experience. Um, you know, I mean, yes, in F2, they run most of the circuits. They run in F1, but not everyone, but... Um, you know that, yeah, probably you need another year in F2, but it's Red Bull. So what do you expect? Uh, I think in turn, uh, this experience will help him as he goes into 2022, um, building his confidence at times. He's going to have hit or miss days. He is basically the Takuma Sato 2.0. He's going to have great days. He's going to be very aggressive. And then there's going to be other times where you're just going to wonder what is wrong with this guy? Why is he doing what he's doing? But he's always going to go at 10 tenths. He doesn't know any different. He's very aggressive. It speaks to, you know, the, you know, the, the culture with driving, I think, especially for the big time drivers. Um, but in the end, for Alpha Tori, the way things are in this constructors championship and in general, um, to get a seventh place finish is solid. You're only two points behind Aston Martin. You're 11 points behind Alpine, and that's after Alpine had an epic, you know, 1-4 today. Um, you know, like the the reality is that that Constructors' Championship, fifth thing in the Constructors' Championship, they came in fifth. They lost two spots, but in the grand scheme of things, they have a good car um, after you get past the four top four teams right now, theoretically, the Al the Alpha Tori is the fifth best car at a lot of these circuits, and I think that'll come through um, once the summer break uh, passes and we'll get to those racetracks. I think we'll see the Alpha Tories up there, and maybe Yuki Sonoda making progress uh, further towards the front, maybe even giving Pierre Gasly a run for his money. Yeah, you never know. Experience will only help him, and I hope he's going to get more solid points finishes. If, if Alpha Tauri can get Sonoda to score points regularly, they should be, you know, pretty comfortable for fifth. But so far, uh, Gasly has just carried that team relatively when you look at the points tally. It's it's a bit, it's not good reading for Sonoda, but he is young, he is a rookie, so you have to give him time. But Red Bull aren't famed for doing that. Saying that though, Alpha Tauri did have a lot better today, day today than Red Bull. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, and another team that had a very, very, very good day was Williams, Tom. Oh, yes. And surprisingly, it was Nicholas Latifi that finished ahead of George Russell. Uh, eighth for Nicholas Latifi, ninth for George Russell today. They've got points. It's happened, and it's catapulted them, catapulted them up to eighth in the Constructors' Championship. This is a huge, huge weekend for them. Yes. It's finally happened at the one race where we probably said, of all the races, it's not going to happen because of what the circuit is like. Oh, isn't life a funny thing? But well done, Williams. Finally, they've got a, a point, and not just a point, but Russell in ninth with two points, Latifi in eighth with four points. That is a good, I mean, you know, it might not sound it, but that is a good haul for them given the struggles they've had over the past few years. Let's not forget their last point was scored by Kubica in 2019 at the German Grand Prix. And he, I say only got that. I'm not taking anything away from it. But he got that 10th place because Hamilton got a, a time penalty, which not was, or a grid penalty, which knocked him back down to 11th. That was the last time that they scored a point. And then before that, I think it was possibly Lance Stroll at Imola, uh, not Imola, 
Monza in 2018. That goes to show how how long this rebuilding process for Williams has been. I mean, we could argue that it has been coming for, for a little while. Obviously, with Russell having some very, very good Q3 appearances, and getting very close. And also, both of the cars were out in Q1 as well. And this is the first time that Russell has been out in Q1 this year, which speaks volumes in itself. But Latifi did really well. Didn't put up too much of a fight when he was running third. I mean, whoever thought we'd be saying that Tifu was running third. But there we are. 2020 is a gift that keeps on giving. Um, and I know we're in 2021, but let's be fair, it's just an extension of last year, isn't it? Um, but, yeah, Latifi, you know, he, he he did as well as he could in that car. And then George Russell as well, obviously. The two of them both just drove really well. Secured the points for the team. They drove a team race, and yeah, brilliant day for them. Yeah, it's yeah. You just never would have seen it coming, especially after qualifying. Russell, like you said, first time this season that he's not been in Q two, and he was out in Q one. They lined up eighteenth and seventeenth on the grid. They finished eighth and ninth. Russell, it did look a little bit like he had a problem early on, but it wasn't. It was just because he. Uh, he was actually in second place behind Hamilton. He would have took over the lead of the race, but some pit lane shenanigans or something like that. He had to, you know, he had to give places back, which was sad for him. But yeah, Nicholas TV for a while was actually running in a podium position in a Williams. It's it's just unbelievable. I mean, Phil, this is this is massive for Williams, like we've said. I mean, this is a new era for Williams, and under no longer under the Williams family ownership, they're under D- Doralton Capital. You know, this this is really what they needed going into 2022. Yeah, it's a huge momentum boost for them. We don't really know what their driver situation is theoretically. I, I mean, for all intents and purposes, Nicholas Latifi will be one of the drivers because his dad has a piece of the organization. For Russell to finally score points in a Williams, as I predicted um, on the preview show, I'm taking over for George after years of, of doing it. Um so it just meant that George had to stop picking and I had to pick him, um, which means I will continue to pick him and he probably won't score the rest of the year. Um, oh, no, be... don't, don't say that. you got a 100% record, Phil. you got to keep it going. Well, well I don't <laughs> think it's going to happen at Spa. Um, but the fact of the matter is um, George scoring, uh, good on him for trying a little something to try to get out and get an advantage. Um, out of pit road, but uh, didn't work out. Um, the fact that he was willing to go and play a teammate role and willing to hope that Latifi could actually hold on to a podium place or whatever um, by pitting was really cool. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that kind of camaraderie and teamwork will exist when he's in a silver and black car of a certain kind of a certain manufacturer soon enough. But until then we'll talk about him and driving for Doritos and all that, and that team and getting all those points, jumping past alpha slobber and jumping past Putin Haas um, puts them in great place in regards to the money that they will be able to get because I have a hard time believing alpha Romeo is going to score the rest of this year. Um, I definitely don't think, that the Putin Haas will score, even though their lead driver today, after having a nightmare FP3, recovered and raced the what was the championship leader very hard, um, reminding me of a certain guy um, that he shares a surname with. Um, you know, that was pretty cool, and it reminded me of some old times there, um, just as they announced the a documentary for his father. So um, we'll talk about that later, but yeah, um, great for Williams as their new entity, what they are moving towards 2022 Capito and that whole group. It seems like momentum is, is building. They're making progress. It's a good thing to see, to see Williams. Cause usually a lot of old teams that were successful back in the day, they go fall by the wayside or they struggle and they basically fall off the grid or get out of racing that's happened all over motorsport. But in Williams case, the name exists still the possibility of success again is there. Um, it'll be with um, a new driver lineup probably next year, but until then, hopefully George can continue building up and maybe get another result 
um, here as we go along later in the second half of the year. Yeah, I mean, he's broke his ducks, hasn't he? He's finally got points, as has Nicholas Satifi as well. Let's not belittle Nicholas Satifi. He did a fantastic job today. Uh, run very well. I didn't really make any mistakes from what I saw. And yeah, I mean, you could have said maybe he should have fought a bit harder, but he can pass in Hungary, as we've, as we saw. We saw plenty of overtakes today. So yeah, six points for Williams. They're up to eighth in the constructors. That's that's just what they needed. They needed that momentum. They needed those points, and they've got them. Um, so yeah, great for Williams, but it, dismal day for Red Bull. A dismal day for Max Verstappen, Tom. But you can't really blame the guy. He he drove as well as he could. Just a damage, a massive damage on the side of his car just really limited the pace of that Red Bull. But he does get a point. It could be very important come the end of the season. Yeah, um, I mean, you really can't blame Verstappen for his performance today because he was taken out indirectly by the other Mercedes, which was an accident. It was you know, granted it was a stupid accident, but it was an accident. Um, and I was fearful that he was even going to get back out on the track at all. I was really concerned that Verstappen was going to retire. Um, but at, at the start, we saw, you know, like I mentioned earlier, he had a good launch. He was he was getting pretty close to Hamilton, but he was keeping it clean. And we've all seen how good Verstappen is in the wet, if we look at Brazil 2016, for example. Um, and yeah, just uh, it, it was, I think, for Red Bull today, especially with Verstappen, it was a case of damage limitation. Um, you know, he was struggling to get past Schumacher because his car, I believe they said he was missing his entire right side pod when he came back in um, and then when the red flag happened and he still had major floor damage, um, you know, just that his car was just chewed to bits and obviously Hungary being fairly aerodynamically dependent anyway, was never going to do him any favours. Um, getting a point is better than nothing um, and also it must help a bit having their sister team take the fastest lap away from Mercedes as well. So all these things could add up, but yeah, Verstappen, he, he, he did as well as he could do, but he was he was never going to sort of like sail back up through the grid, unfortunately, as much as I'd like to have seen it. Yeah, it was always going to be difficult for me. In the end, he couldn't even overtake the Williams, which normally he breezed past, no worries at all. No disrespect to Williams, but there's a massive difference between them and the Red Bulls normally. Um, but yeah, the point for Max Verstappen, it could have been worse. Hamilton doesn't get the fastest lap point. So that's, that's twice in a row that Red Bull have effectively taken that off Hamilton in the closing stages. So, yeah, there we go. Um, 11th and 14th place to date were the Alfa Romeos, Phil. We, you know, it, it, was a, it was a big opportunity this weekend for teams that don't normally score points to score big points like Alpine, like Williams. But Alfa Romeo today, just they were just nowhere. Both drivers had penalties and they weren't fast anyway. So, I mean... It's just it's just not very good for them, and of course they're down to ninth in the constructors now as well. They're behind Williams. Yeah, it was a, a poor, um, underwhelming performance from the Alpha Slauber team. But the fact of the matter is, it's kind of expected. It's a shame when you consider you lose more than a quarter of the grid um, within five laps of the race, and you couldn't even sniff a point. Um, Giovinazzi tried to go out on slicks at the start. It was a wrong move. Then he sped through the pit roads and then he got a penalty. You had Kimi Raikkonen, uh, you know, he, I forget where or what he did. And he ended up getting a 10 second stop go penalty. And then on top of that, when they changed whatever strategy they were on to, instead of finishing 14th, finish 12th or whatever, um, came out in the way of the Hamilton um, uh, Alonso battle too, uh, which in turn probably affected the final result. So credit to them for just being in the way. Um, and, um, you know, Kimi Raikkonen running out the string, um, running out his, uh, I mean, even though he has a piece of the team, which I think is the only reason why he's still driving, um, uh, because his driving and his focus is not really there anymore. It's akin to what he was doing when he was driving a rally car, really, um, when he would wreck most of the time. Uh, so it'll we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, Spa and, and Monza, they're more uh, that, that team. They run low down force. They run more for top speed. 
So maybe those racetracks might suit them a little better. Maybe they can come back and sneak a point, but I doubt it. Um, I guess we'll see what happens with them. But to be determined, wasn't a great day for them today, though. Yeah, really bad day, a pointless day. And yeah, it's hard to see them really get, because they effectively need to get five points to overtake Williams at this point. It's, it's a big, big ass with that car. That car is not fast. Um, but yeah, so b- bad for Alfa Romeo. Bad for Daniel Ricciardo as well, Tom. I mean, some people are thinking maybe he'll sneak a podium. Maybe maybe he could even win like in 2014. This is a track that normally suits him, but for one reason or another, he finished 12 out of 14 runners in the third fastest car. It's, it's a very bad reason. And it's very bad for McLaren as well, who, you know, fall closer to Ferrari now. Yeah. Um, this, especially with, with all the retirements that went on today, Danny Rick really should have been ahead of the Alfa Romeo Kimi should have been ahead of Verstappen arguably and should have been ahead of the Williams realistically Um, especially with Lando retiring he really needed to pick up some points even if it was just a handful of points he really really needed to pick up some points to boost McLaren's um, chances of, of sort of holding P3 in the constructors because if you look at sort of the points that Ferrari, Ferrari got, yes, his damage limitation a bit because obviously Leclerc didn't finish. But McLaren have walked away with nothing this weekend, effectively. Well, worse than that, they've walked away with a big repair bill for Lando's car, which wasn't his fault. And they've walked away with an elder driver who was supposed to come in and set the world on fire, but has been a damp squib. And... We're now we're halfway through the season, give or take. We're about to go into the summer break. We're eleven out of twenty-three races in. Obviously, twenty-three are subject to discussion at the moment, thanks to COVID. Um, but today, like I said, McLaren needed someone to pick up points. If that would have been signs in that other McLaren, for a start, he probably would not have qualified P twelve. He'd have probably qualified about P seven, P six. He'd have been right there with Lando. If you look at how close they were last year. Um, I mean, it's hard to say exactly because obviously Lando has stepped up so much this year. But if we, you know, from what history has told us over the past two years when those two were teammates, McLaren would have still had an all right chunk of points this weekend, even if they would have lost one car. But Daniel Ricciardo, hopefully he can figure something out over the over the three week break we got coming up. You know, hopefully he can. I don't know if he's going to do simulator work or or what, but he needs to get comfortable in that McLaren because their patience is going to be very, very slowly wearing thin. And the other thing we've got to factor in is if there's no room at Mercedes for George Russell, McLaren is a Mercedes power car. There could be some influence there. It's a very good point. It's a very good point. And when you've got people like Pierre Gasly as well, doing great guns and trying to desperately get out of the Alpha Tower, why would he not consider well. it? Yeah, absolutely. Very good point, George. Yeah, so it, it's 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 really bad reading for Daniel Ricciardo. I love the guy as a person, as a driver. I really do. He, he seems to, I can't remember who said it, but he said hot or cold, you know, he's a hot or cold driver. I think it might be Phil who said it, actually. Um, you know, he's a hot or cold driver. He's a form driver. He seems to do well one weekend. He did well at Silverstone. He was, on, he was one place behind Lando Norris. And then he goes and finishes out of the points. He finishes 12 out of 14 finishing drivers in, in the McLaren where Williams scored points, Ocon won the race. You know, Ricardo should have been well up there. He avoided the accident. He did the hard part. But for, it just seemed to slip down and just couldn't couldn't get past the Williams. And yeah, there he was, 12. Um, shocking, really. But... You know, you got to give the guy time at the end of the day, but how much time do you give him? He's in his 30s. He's been in Formula 1 for 10 years now. He's an experienced guy. He's really got to perform at Spa and Monza and um, and Zandvoort as well, which are all coming up in a triple header uh, once the season's uh, summer break ends. Um, But, yeah, we'll we'll get on to the last finisher that we've not mentioned today. Uh, Mick Schumacher, Phil, like you said, he had a great battle with Max Verstappen. Maybe went a little bit over the line, but... Still, he was running in the points for a little while in the Haas. He he just did everything he could. He hung it out there as long as he could on a set of medium ties. I think he was probably hoping for a safety car, but it never came. And yeah, unlucky 13 for him, but he did everything he could. Best finish, I think, for him so far. 
Um, granted, you needed to lose all those people um, out of the race, but Mick showed why he's an F2 champion. He showed why he's in Grand Prix in at Formula One right now. He kind of showed the moxie and guile and all the other things that, you know, his dad had. Um, and the fact of the matter is his car is a piece of garbage and he was able to hold off a damaged Red Bull, um, for a while. Um, he was able to hold off theoretically the best driver on the grid, you know, arguably for many laps. Um, he held off a bunch of cars there and, and for a while, I mean, he was ahead of the Alfa Romeos too. I mean, so for that team and for where they are. I mean, Alfa Romeo, of course, they had a horrible day. They affected Egghead. Um, that might be the first time Egghead's actually not been at a fault for an incident um, because they were – oh, it was the unsafe release. There you go. That's now I reminded myself why Kimi Raikkonen got his man. So unsafe release on that pit stop on the start, the restart, and he hit Egghead and ended his day, but that would have meant that he would have finished last, so that's whatever. He didn't finish last today, so I mean, he wasn't going to finish last today. So the fact that Mick was able to be up there and battle a little bit and actually seem like he is in a Grand Prix for the first time all year um, was nice after his FP3 incident. Great job by their team to rebuild a car. Um, You know, who knows what is coming for that team uh, next year um, in regards to what they're going to bring for 2022. But I hope they provide anything, any semblance of life, um, because Mick Schumacher can do the job if you give him something to work with. And I think the fact that he's learning, because I always say his second year is his better year, he's learning this is brutal. They have a terrible car. And he was finally able to compete a little bit, albeit, you know, different strategies. I think the the pace is there and the ability is there. Um that you know, if they give him something to work with, then he might be able to do something. But I'll only we'll only really know about that um, next year um, once they bring out the new cars. But credit to me, credit to them for not looking like an absolute waste of time uh, for once this year, um, and bringing in, hearkening back to his father um, with the hard battles that he had with some of these great drivers today. Um, it was cool to see Mick up there uh, in the points for a little while. Yeah, it was good to see. And like you said, if you give Mick Schumacher a decent car, he'll do very well, especially next year. Cause yeah, he normally does pretty steady in his first season in a new series. And then after that, he pushes on and yeah, that's what happened in F2. Uh, he became champion in his second year there. So yeah. And also like you mentioned as well, Voldemort, he, he was crashed out in the pit lane. It wasn't his fault somehow, you know, you could, you can hate the guy all you want. That was not his fault. That was Alfa Romeo's fault. And Kimi Raikkonen just slammed into the side of him and he broke his suspension and he was out of the race. So, yeah, he wasn't going to do much anyway, given how far Max Schumacher finished. Uh, Max Schumacher, Mick Schumacher finished in the end. Um, but, yeah, so that is the whole grid. That is the whole set of drivers. Just an un- unbelievable race, like we said. Yeah, so much to cover. One thing I don't think we've mentioned, though, is that Valtteri Bottas, for that start line crash, does have a five place grid penalty going into Spa. If I'm being honest, I'm surprised it's not a little more. As does Lance Stroll. As does Lance Stroll as well. Deserved, yeah. Uh-huh. Fair enough. At least they're consistent on this. So yeah. there we go. I, th- I think it could have been more easily for them, I'll be honest. Uh, but there we go. So yeah, I have mentioned uh, that you guys are both part, both part of the podcast. Uh, Tom, I mentioned that you're part of the EF1 podcast. Uh, what is that and where can people find it? So you can find EF1, which is short for Everything F1. We have a website, which is everythingf1.com. Then we have Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord server, and a podcast. So our Facebook page is at Join EF1. Our Instagram is at Join EF1. Our Twitter is at Join EF1. Then our Facebook group, which is thriving, is the Everything F1 paddock. Um, we welcome all sorts of comments, questions, interactions, basically just be nice um and then the discord server is the everything f1 discord server you can find a link to that on our website and also our podcast is the everything f1 podcast which goes out every wednesday or thursday um and actually yours truly guest hosted it last week as well 
very nice. I haven't listened to that one yet, but yeah, those guys do do a great show. They get some fantastic guests on, uh, and I've been on as well. It's it's really really good podcast to listen to. Um, Phil, I've mentioned you're part of the Grip Strip podcast, the GSP, as you like to abbreviate it to. What is that, and where can people find it? Yeah, the Grip Strip podcast. Uh, you've been on it before. Um, Tom from the Monkey Sea podcast actually uh, came through and uh, did a guest. Uh, host co-host uh, deal for us this past week talk about all things motorsports uh, not only in the states here but also in, around the world cover formula one indycar nascar um, as long as it goes fast we usually talk about it here on the gsp um, we can we're on uh, what is it here we're on Am- apple Podcasts, amazon music spotify podbean pandora uh iHeartRadio, Stitcher, tune in. We've gotten past a thousand downloads, so or it's been a while. It's been over a year. We're getting there slowly but surely. It's a process. Um, executive producer, aka me, is part of the reason why it's probably slower than it needs to be. But you know, it's a passion project, and it keeps me connected. And it's part of the reason why we've all been able to meet. You know the. The Grid Talk podcast has been a great um, way to connect with a lot of fans and a lot of people who have the same passion for motorsport, and it's a good thing, and we'll hopefully continue it as we go along as Grid Talk um, grows and as Tom show grows and as, you know, for um, all of us, this is such a great thing because it brings together two things. It brings together a bunch of people who love the sport and also brings together something that we all like formula one is it doesn't matter how good bad or indifferent how stupid things may look or how goofy some of the drivers may be but we all love it and it put brings us all together so um thanks george as always for having me on and um looking forward to the next one once we get back from uh the summer break oh always welcome phil and yeah definitely check out the gsp you know phil and sam are Sam, oh god, I'm getting people's names wrong. Phil Josh. And Josh, yeah, I don't know why I said Sam. <laughs> at Grip Strip Pod on Twitter as well. At Phil G Matthew for me, if you want to find, and at JP Huffine for Sam Josh, um, if you want to follow <laughs> him and his um, uh, uh, Twitch streams when he's on iRacing. Yes. Yeah, so uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Oh yeah. So definitely check out those guys' show. Like like Phil said, I've I've been on it. So a good laugh and they obviously cover a lot of series not just formula one but anything that goes fast like they said nascar indycar all that good stuff and the junior series as well the formula uh formula one feeder series too and um, so yeah uh i've got a mention as well it has been it, this is an incredible race let's not get away from that but let's also remember that today was a pretty tragic weekend for motor racing as a whole uh there was a marshal at brands hatch who tragically passed away uh, in an incident uh, involving, I think it was a sports car race or something like that. The car catapulted over the barrier. And unfortunately, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time and has succumbed to his injuries. So uh, we just want to give our, offer our condolences to his, all his friends and family. You know, it's um, what marshals do. It's a job that a lot of people don't notice. Uh, you don't see a lot of the time, but without them, we can't go racing. They make sure that you know the track is clear and safe for everybody to race and we can't thank them enough without them like we said there would be no racing so they give us the sport that we love um and i also need to mention as well uh jack aiken you may remember making a cameo appearance for williams uh the, towards the end of last season he's been racing in uh the 24 hours of spa and he was involved in a almighty shun at, at you know chillingly at the same point that antoine hubert passed away at three years ago, uh, just at the top of Eau Rouge at Radion. Uh, he was involved in a horrible accident there. He's still in hospital. I think he's got a punctured lung. He's got a, a fracture in his back. I, I don't think it's too overly serious. I think he's going to make a full recovery. That's what I've heard. Just want to wish him all the best in his uh, recovery as well. I think the other guy was uh, heavily involved in that was, uh, was it Davide Regon. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, he um, he's in hospital as well. His injuries are not as serious. He was not, and um, he was not as heavily involved. But yeah, I feel I think both are going to make a full recovery before too long. So just want to wish them all the best in that as well. We never see like to see nasty accidents like that. Um, it's yeah, 
like I said, chilling. It sends chills down your spine seeing stuff like that. Um, so yeah, like I mentioned earlier on, uh, if you leave us a five-star review on iTunes, you get to have a shout out at the start of the show. We, of course, go out live on YouTube now, so you get to see the show before it hits the usual platforms, you know, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, Verbal, Omni Studio, Pocket Cast. You get to see it before all those. Just search for the F1 Grid Talk on all those platforms. You'll be able to find us, follow us, subscribe to us, like us, all, all that good stuff. And you can go check out our back catalogue as well. Over 100 episodes for you to enjoy now, including Ayrton Senna, uh, the Tiregate one, uh, a special on the 1994 Benetton conspiracy, and of course our usual previews, qualifying reports, and our race reviews too. Uh, and I want to thank my panellists as well for joining me. Thank you very much for joining us, Tom and Phil. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. And yet yeah, we'll be back in, I think it's four weeks' time, to preview the Belgian Grand Prix. We've got a nice break now. We can all relax, collect ourselves, calm ourselves down after that amazing race that we've just witnessed. Yeah, we'll see you for that one. Goodbye. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. That was a long one, but it was always going to be after that race, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. It? Yeah, that's something. Hey, you got George, Georgie boy crying after getting that. Uh... After getting the point. Yeah, I was yeah. just oh, about wow. to say that. And Hamilton's been taken to the doctors for fatigue and dizziness. Well, he, he was he was clearly out of breath, wasn't he, during the race? Well, he like... was absolutely knackered. If you look at him on the podium, he was absolutely like exhausted. And but it's all but it's all in the car, of course. Remember that, Tom? <sighs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, and Kyle and Kyle Larson is a better race car driver than him too. And if Kyle Larson was in a, he's a NASCAR driver here. And he drives sprint cars on dirt and whatever. So um, as long as he was in a Mercedes, he could be Lewis Hamilton as well. So we can add that to the list of ways to go and denigrate Lewis Hamilton because he's a black guy versus guys who are idiot sticks like Kyle Larson. Collarbone, fractured vertebrae. So that's Jack Ake and broken yeah. collarbone, fractured vertebrae, building damn strong chassis. Yeah, I'm high on painkillers. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I bet he's. Yeah, he's, he's got to be after that as an eight. Tripping he's, major balls. I mean, just one of them injuries is going to be painful enough, but he's got a whole yeah. shopping list. Danny Blessing, it's. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how long it'll keep him out for, but at the end of the day, you know, the main thing is he's going to be all right, apparently. So. Yeah. Right, just looking at the chat now. Ruby, our other regular host, has done a few comments in here. Uh, honestly, fair play to Red Bull for getting Verstappen's car into a points position by the end, even if it was eventually on strategy, because even that one point could make all the difference. And yeah, I mentioned that. One, I mean, there's only six points between Hamilton and Verstappen at the moment. One point could make a massive difference come the end of the year. And the amount of damage on there, you know, yeah, he was helped by the Red Bull being quick anyway, but he's done very well there, especially when you consider dirty air and stuff too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, you know, for Sappen did well to sort of like hold off as well as he did. You know, it's just, I've not really got anything to add to it. You know, he was, he just damaged limitation in more sense than one. Yeah, I mean, their race was was run in turn one, lap one, and them getting a point is better. And then, you know, the, the junior teams taking off the fastest lap point as well um, saved them two points here this weekend after no points last or two weeks ago. And then, um, you know, and then also for Perez, it's not – and no points last two races too is – um, put a big um, dent in. I mean, the reality is they didn't. He didn't lose anything in regards to third in the drivers' championship, but in terms of the constructors' championship, it's not been a very positive uh, two weeks for Red Bull, which at one point had near fifty point lead um, in the constructors' championship. So, um, I guess we will see what happens post summer break. Yeah, it'd be very interesting because yeah. Mercedes. They qualified on pole. I'd had second place as well. I don't. They've not done that very often at all this year. I don't think so. They at the moment it looks like they might have the fastest car again. But it's chalk and cheese between Hungaroring and Spa. It's a completely different circuit. So 
we'll see. I think Red Bull probably do have the advantage around a power track, but who knows? I mean, that, yeah, there's a factory shutdown, but three or four weeks is a, is a long time in F1 for development. Don't you? Yeah. So just yeah, going through the comments here, Infinite TK has put, uh, no, Alonso was the deciding factor. Lewis was behind Alonso longer than anyone else. Lewis finished eight tenths after eight tenths behind after being four seconds down in the space of two laps. Lewis nearly did a last to first. Yeah, he nearly did. To be fair, he was only just off, only just off the lead in the end. But I think we did say about how Signs and Alonso they were so key to this race. You know, if Signs pitted when Ferrari wanted him to, he wouldn't have finished anywhere near where he did. And Alonso with his defensive display, yeah, just unbelievable. Using all the experience, it's. It's what you love to see at the end of the day. Dri- I mean, we all like to see passing, but seeing two drivers properly going at it, racing for several laps, there's a real beauty in that, I think, in racing. I, I, don't, I don't think it's appreciated as much as overtakes, you know, just the fighting and the defending. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, Alonso's like, d- defensive work and, and everything today was just, uh, it was just wonderful to watch. You know, just to see someone really dinning their elbows out, really like saying, Hampton, no, you're not going to, you know, I'm not just going to walk over and let you buy. You've really got to fight your way past me. Yeah. And Alonso used all those years of experience. And obviously, he's been too much of Hamilton to grant this in 2007. And perhaps Hamilton, Alonso, and Hungary don't necessarily go very well together. But, um, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but, but, yeah, but uh, Alonso, yeah. Oh, that was just scintillating to watch. There was a point where they were going up into turn four and Hamilton was, was trying to go around the outside and Alonso was in the middle of the track. I don't know how they didn't bang wheels or how Hamilton's front left didn't get caught in, in the right-hand side of Alonso's car. It was that close, but that goes to show just how good both of those drivers are and how much respect they have for each other. It was amazing to watch. Very true. I, I thought they did hit. I was convinced they were they did it, but they didn't. There was you know, it's that old saying you couldn't get for a cigarette paper between the two of them. It was yeah, yeah. Just two drivers, two great champions, knowing exactly where their cars are. They know each other like the back of their hands as well, like for their racing styles and stuff. They knew exactly how to fight with each other. It's it's just brilliant. It's just it brilliant, and we need more of that. We do, yeah. But I, I think you can definitely see some of. Um... Some of Alonso's influence uh, rubbing off on Ocon, because if you look at how mm. Ocon was positioning himself when Vettel was trying to get past, there was definitely more than a hint of Alonso in that, and that's only a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. He, you you can almost see Alonso going to Ocon like, "This is how you do this. This is how you defend out of this corner. You do this. He'll do this, and this is what you do." Yeah, you, know, you can almost see that, which is something you wouldn't expect from Alonso, really. People, he has been a negative influence on on teams. People even go as far as say he's toxic for teams, but he's not for Alpine right now. Maybe he's finally properly matured. Maybe he finally sees how to do this, and he's fully committed to this Alpine project, like uh, like Phil said earlier on. That's definitely what it seems to be. It'll be interesting to see what twenty twenty two brings for Ocon, Alonso, and Alpine. It'll be mm. very interesting to see how that goes. Definitely, definitely. Maybe tempers will flare when there's more on offer, but who knows? We'll see. Maybe they'll work it together. I hope they do. Um, So, uh, I promise you this is his name. I'm not making this up. His name's uh, Jungle Brother has commented. uh, (laughs) As a rabid ham foesie, I'm gutted he didn't get the win. I'll take a podium with Red Bull only getting one point. Could have been a great day. Uh, Yeah, he could have got a last to first, like like Infinite said. But... um, Third is still really good in the circumstances. There's no getting away from that. I mean, earlier, early on at the start, he was really frustrated. He was like, this is a joke. This isn't right. When I mean, he was trying to get past, I think it was Gasly. Um, and you could almost see maybe he's starting to slump. Maybe he's getting frustrated, taking too much out of the tyres. But in the end, it worked out. The stops from Mercedes leapfrogged him up the order. And some great racing from Hamilton as well made a difference, really. That's how he got on the podium. Yeah. I mean, it was... It, you, there's very few drivers I would have been able to do um, what Lewis was able to do in that spot. I mean, granted, 
Uh, I think when he qualifies on pole yesterday, you think there's a good chance that number 100 happens today, but unfortunately it wasn't in the cards. Uh, but in, in turn, he had a great race. He provided a lot of entertainment, him and Alonzo bringing it back old school. And then um, he's the world championship leader going into the break. And Mercedes has the constructors championship lead going into the break. So it's a net positive in what could be construed in some circles. If you are a fan like I am, it, in the one hand, it's a bummer. But on the other hand, uh, positive things to take into the break as they come back for a, a three, a triple header that will be very um, crucial in regards to what we see in the second half of the season regarding the world championship. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Big props to uh, Infinite TK, Jungle Brother and Ruby. You've put in a lot of comments on here. I'm just trying to get through them now. So Infinite TK's put, mate, the double standards are hilarious. Before Alonso retired, he was a meme. Now people are comparing him to Lewis. Well, I think, yeah. He was some... a different driver. Before... Sorry, Josh, I can jump in on this one. When Alonso was coming towards the twilight of his career, when he was with McLaren... Um, he was not the same as what he's like now. I'm not talking about his driving ability because that has never, ever, ever been in question. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about what he was like on the, on, on the team radio. If, if we look at his outburst of GP2 engine, GP2 engine, if we look at all the times that, that he sort of almost got a bit bitchy, for want of a better phrase, on the radio. Whereas now, today, it was definitely a different aura to him when he was racing. I don't know whether that's because he's more settled with the Enstone team, which he's obviously in his third iteration with, or if that's because he's perhaps racing different series and experienced different team environments. But I disagree with that comment in the sense that it's not it's not specifically a double standard. It's just Alonso is does seem to be approaching things in a different way. Like we said a few minutes ago, what 2022 brings, because if there's more potentially more reward on offer, then will we maybe see sort of that more competitive side of him coming out again? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, with, I'm with you there. Like, you know, his driving ability is always, we've always, he's always been in the top echelon. We've always rated oh, him highly, but always. it's just, it's just some people just ignore that. Some people just looked at the results and thought, oh, he's always out of the points. No, he was in a terrible McLaren Honda and then a terrible McLaren Renault after that. And his, on track and off track antics, you know, the GP2 engine and just the negative impact he had on that team. I feel that's what made him a meme. It was never, ever him as a driver. Nobody it just, just even then, just look at his starts during that period. Like he, he just fly past people. The guy had race craft by the bucket load and it showed it's just, he didn't have the machinery to hold it for a whole race distance. Yeah. He's a, He's, he's uh, Alonso is good, really, really good. Um, I do need to say that I've just been sent an article. Now, this is from racefans.net, so take it with a pinch of salt. Mm. But it says, at the moment, Ocon, Vettel, Sainz, Bottas and Stroll are all under investigation. So Ocon and Sainz, are, are, and, Ocon, Sainz and Vettel are under investigation for failing to follow the race director's instructions on post-race procedures. Oh, no. Um, I think this is because they didn't sort of like loop back around into the pits. Um, now, Bottas and Stroll, oh, for God's sake, are under investigation for violations of the pre-race procedures, including the We Race as One observance and podium ceremony. Um, these regulations state drivers must remove their T-shirts and attend the national anthem performance wearing their race suits. Footage of the ceremony indicates Vettel did not do this, wearing a T-shirt showing his support for LGBTQ plus rights oh, no. during the Hungarian national anthem. Now, it says, obviously, that Vettel and other drivers, because Hamilton obviously spoke, spoke out about it, um, and I'm not getting into it, but I fully, fully support what, ha what Hamilton and Vettel are saying about this. Now, mm. Vettel has said... I'm quoting here. He said, Vettel suggested after the race, the T-shirt was the reason for a summons. Vettel said, they can disqualify me. He said this guy. He said this is guy. And he also said, they can do what they want. I would do it again. Yeah. I love Vettel. Yeah. That's just, what a guy. Yeah. And, and both Hamilton and Vettel absolutely 
bang on for standing up for for the for this thing. Yeah. Sorry, so, sorry, sorry, sorry. When I say standing up for this thing, I didn't I didn't phrase that very well. What I meant was st- standing up for what they're standing up for this weekend because it's a very very important topic. Yeah. Yeah, and considering that it's backwards and the way it is, I mean, it when you have the two most prolific drivers on the grid really um, taking this stance, it proves that there are people that actually have voices and they're using them for a positive, whether you want to agree or not is whatever. But uh, I think it's a great thing what Lewis and Seb have done here this weekend. And in general, Absolutely. I think Sebastian... I think he's woken up from hibernation after a couple of years of struggling. Um, I think now he's kind of back to being himself again, which is a great thing because I think for however long he's going to continue driving in Formula One, it's he's a good presence. Um, and if he's running the way he is running, I mean, I think maybe a win might be coming sooner rather than later again, which would be great for all of his fans. Hmm. Yeah, you, Ruby put that story as well in the chat. So thank you for that. Sorry, Tom, go on. No, I was gonna say no, I was just gonna say no, just from Phil, I agree with you. It'd be lovely to see Seb on the top step again, especially after his last year with Ferrari that was so torrid. Mm. Um the, the only thing I'd say is for Seb to get up there, I think we would need a bit of a race like we had today. Yeah. Or like we had in Baku. Or it was you know, you know it, it I don't with the greatest of respect to Seb I, and Aston Martin, I don't think it would happen on merit with how strong the top two teams are this year. Yeah, it's it's true. I agree. But I think the hopefully for next year, if these regulations work the way that they did the last time they had a massive regulation change in 2009, um, who knows, maybe some teams hit it and some teams don't. Or 2014 with the mo- engines as well to a lesser extent. But yeah. Um, I think the 2009 regs is where we go and it's where Red Bull came through finally. And then um, what is the current Mercedes team, but was, you know, um, Braun back then then, Mm. and Williams and the double diffusers and the whole thing like that. Yeah. You know, I think it's an opportunity and we'll see what happens with that. Absolutely. I've just gone through some of these comments. I was going to comment here, but I'll just say it instead. Jungle Brother, this is not a Red Bull channel. I guarantee it. I, I personally, I'm a McLaren fan. I, I believe, Tom, I think, are you a bit of a McLaren or a Red Bull fan? I'm not sure. I can't remember now. Both. Both, yeah, so fair yeah. enough. And Phil, I mean, you're, you're a Hamilton fan. Are you a bit of a Mercedes fan overall, would you say? Yeah, generally speaking. I mean, I root for McLaren because of Ricardo, and they have uh, connections here in the States too, and Zach Brown, um, all that. So basically, I root for them, and of course Russell. So yeah, so it's not a Red Bull channel. We assure you, honestly. Um, if you go back and look at our uh, British GP review, we all came to a kind of agreement that it was a racing incident between Hamilton and Red Bull. If we were a Red Bull channel, we wouldn't have been saying that. We would have been going on along the lines of. Uh, Marco and Karen Horner has, has yeah. been christened now. I just want to figure out that, to be honest. <laughs> I do I'm, too. I'm so I'm... fed up of everything that's going on about it. And I'm saying this as a Red Bull fan. It's like, just give it a rest. Yeah. It's, it's like if it they were so busy, again. if they're so, with all the ball licking those guys do, you know, for all the <laughs> whining you people do, you have one point in two races. I mean, you didn't even. I mean, Sergio Perez was hitting Kimi Raikkonen, who's just a freaking turnstile now, at 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 freaking Silverstone. I mean, what is this? You know, like, you at some point the whining and moaning and everything. Like, it was funny how Karen had to go and put the jacket on one-eyed Marco because it didn't seem like Marco knew that he was out there on the racetrack and that they had to put the jacket that he had to put a jacket on because it was raining. That was on the sky broadcast. I don't know if you saw that George, but it looked like that, that uh, Marco was kind of lost. Like he was lost, like a guy who's got like dementia. Yeah. And so, Mm -hmm. which makes sense because he probably is. And um, he is an idiot and a douchebag. So, (laughs) I mean, it's like for fuck's sake, just stop it already. I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous, it, isn't it? It's like go and beat him on the track, which is what I thought was going to happen. And yeah. maybe they would have had a chance again today. But, you know, Valtteri had other ideas, and so be it. But the fact of the matter 
is you didn't put yourself in a position in qualifying. You practiced well in practice one, but then from there, Mercedes had the edge. And you can whine all you want about it, and you can say all this, oh, we're going to take a 10-grid spot penalty. Go and take your 10-grid spot penalty next race. Go and take it at Spa. You can at least overtake at Spa, and there's multiple DRS zones. Overdo mm. it at freaking Monza. You have multiple ways to overtake. I mean, what is it? If you really want to go and whine and moan, you can go and make something happen. You have the best car. I'm I'm sick of this notion that it's like, oh, you're you're dead to rights and you're near to do like you have the best car theoretically ha- Verstappen's been the better driver over the the season he mm. has basically whenever it's been a head-to-head battle between the two of them he's been the one that stood out so go out there and do your job I mean it's it's really not that it's not it shouldn't be this close you could say oh it's because Hamilton took him off no no it's because Red Bull has done things to themselves over the year, which cost them points, which in turn, they still probably could have both of the leads in both the drivers and constructors championship. Um, and considering how useless Valtteri Botas has been for most of this year, um, Sergio Perez's performance at times this year has also been um, mind numbing. But when you consider it's a second Red Bull seat, um, they haven't, they haven't went and done um, the stuff they used to do to the old drivers where they just basically give them a piece of crap and they'd always have problems with it. Um, these are mistakes. Um, these are errors, um, whether by other people or by Sergio himself, that have cost them points. Um, if it wasn't for recovering Baku, I mean, what would we really be saying about Sergio Perez right now and his situation coming into next year. I mean, they were making Nico made the mention about Gasly wanting to go back to Red Bull in the second seat. Like, Mm. is that even a conversation? I was surprised he said that too, because at first I heard of that was during the commentary. I thought, what are you on about Nico? That's, that's just not happening. They said it's not going to happen. Yeah. I don't, there's no way because they, because they need, they say they need a leader at um, Alpha Tori. It's more like, um, they don't really have anybody else, um, even though they've gotten rid of a laundry list of guys. You could just look at Formula E and the World Endurance Championship and IndyCar, and you could probably find a bunch of these people that have had Red Bull connections. And you could probably find two people that could go and drive for them, but they wouldn't be able to hold up to the stupidity of Red Bull. <laughs> Nearly half the grid's got Red Bull connections. I mean, look at Daniel Ricciardo and Carlos Sainz, for example. Yeah, right? They're exactly. excellent Red Bull drivers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and the two was- best drivers they've ever had, um, one of them was a BMW junior driver and Sebastian Vettel first, and they mm. stole him from Sauber and BMW. And then Max Verstappen was going to go to Mercedes, and because Red Bull was like, oh, yeah, we'll give you a ride at 16. Oh, yeah, sure. You know, like... <laughs> Neither driver was their development. I mean, in, in to be fair, like let's stop acting like they know about how great driver development. They're, they're great once they leave Red Bull. Um, I think Ricardo might be the the exception to the rule, I guess. But mm-hmm. yeah, I've got to get going, guys. But before yeah, I do, I will just well. read out a few comments as well. Uh, where is it? Esteban Ocon, according to Hayden Carvalho, thank you for joining the conversation. Esteban Ocon's been given a reprimand. So I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what he's heard. Um, interesting comment as well from uh, Dimer XXX. Uh, he's put Alonso. Uh, Alonso said to the Spanish media, "This isn't Spanish; it's direct translation." He said uh, they were, he was compare. They, he was asking about comparing this battle today with Lewis to the one with Michael Schumacher in 2005 at Imola, and he said uh, Michael was three times faster than me in Imola. Hamilton was at least two and a half seconds a lap faster than me today. Hamilton just kept making the same mistakes, and I took advantage of it. Oh, fighting talk, fighting talk. I love that from Alonso. Um, and as well, Dime has also put. Uh, I probably said your name wrong. I do apologize for that if I am. Um, he's also said that Rosberger said to Sky F1 in Germany that Toto Wolf went to see Christian Horner after the race uh, in Silverstone, but Christian Horner did not accept his apology. No, it was, it was probably season at the time. Yeah, you know, red mist and all that. Yeah. 
which I get, but I don't think he changed his response, and I think Red Bull have really done themselves a disservice. No. So, yeah, anyway, thank you, everybody, for joining us on the live stream chat. I did say last time I'd reply to your comments after, but it doesn't work like that, sadly, unfortunately. But, yeah, we've got to go. Well, like I said, we'll be back in a few weeks' time to preview Belgium, if not something a little before, but we'll keep you up to date on the F1 Chronicle Twitter, at F1 Chronicle. Do follow us on there, and you'll see what we're doing. And like us on Facebook as well, uh, F1 Chronicle on there. All right, lads. Cheers. Been great. And uh, yeah, we'll see you soon. All right, guys. Cheers. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. See you later.